Good evening. Thank you for joining me for our midweek Bible study. This week we are looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares as we continue in Matthew chapter 13. This is the second in this series of parables about the kingdom of heaven that Jesus shares in this chapter. It's interesting to note that Matthew is the only gospel that records this parable. And in Matthew's gospel, parables are portrayed as having coded knowledge that wouldn't be understood by just anyone. So Jesus tells the story in public as he's talking to the crowds, but he doesn't explain it until later when he's having a private conversation with his disciples. Let's read the text together. Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in this field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skipping to verse 34. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will, pro will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their fathers. Let anyone with ears listen. The story itself is pretty straightforward, and just like the parable of the sowers, which comes before it, and the parable of the mustard seed that comes after it, it develops from the shared agricultural experience of those listening to Jesus teach. A farmer goes out and plants a field using good seed, but afterwards, a subversive enemy came behind and sowed weeds in the same field. As the plants grew and reached maturity, a servant recognized the weeds among the wheat and asked the farmer what he should do. The farmer knew that if he tried to remove the weeds, they would damage the wheat. So he decided it was best to let them both grow until harvest when they could be separated and used for different purposes. You will recall from last week that farmers in the ancient Middle East didn't plant in rows like we do. But instead, they would broadcast the seed widely and then plow the ground to turn the seeds under. The weed that's being talked about in this parable, called tares in the King James Version, is the Greek word zizania. It refers to undesirable weeds in general, but it's typically used to describe a plant that was known as darnel, which was a plague to ancient farmers. This grassy weed, also known as bearded darnel or false wheat, is almost impossible to distinguish from regular wheat when the plants are young. It's only when the heads of grain begin to form that their differences become apparent. While the plants are growing, the tough roots of the hardy darnel grow really deep and they become intertwined with the roots of the wheat. 
And by the plant, time that the plants grow big enough to tell them apart, those roots are so intertwined that it is impossible to pull one out without the other coming with it. But once they're harvested, the two have to be separated because the Darnell seeds are poisonous. Ingesting them can cause dizziness or nausea, hallucinations, and in significant amounts, even death. So despite the added labor that, the two, that, that it took, the two had to be separated after harvest. Then the Darnell could be bundled up and used for fuel for cooking fires or pottery kilns. Now, so far, this makes sense even though we may wonder why someone would seek to sabotage another's wheat crop like this. What kind of enemy must this be? The disciples wondered too, but the author of Matthew has them waiting until after Jesus tells the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven before they get their explanation. In verses 34 and 35, Matthew revisits the idea that Jesus told intentionally obscure parables in keeping with divine instruction to Old Testament prophets to prophesy even though many would not understand them or accept their words. Matthew says that Jesus' teachings fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet saying, I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Now, this citation doesn't come from a prophetic book in the Old Testament. Instead, it's adapted from Psalm 78, verse 2, which says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. This psalm is contributed to Asaph, who prophesied under the direction of the king, David, according to the book of First Chronicles. Remember that Jesus was regarded as a descendant of David, and Psalm 78 was largely a recitation of God's saving acts in history for the Israelites. So early believers came to consider that Jesus was the one who fulfilled God's ultimate work of salvation. Psalm 78, 1 and 2 was seen as a prophecy of Jesus' teaching in parables, revealing hidden mysteries of God's work among humans. After Jesus retreated from the crowds and was visiting with the disciples in a house, the disciples asked him to explain the parables of the weeds of the field. What follows is a strongly allegorical interpretation, and scholars are a bit divided as to whether that interpretation goes back to Jesus or to the author of Matthew's special source, or if it was the author's own interpretation of Jesus' words in this setting with his disciples. The allegory goes like this. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, Jesus, while the enemy who sowed the weeds is the devil. The field is the world. The good seeds are the children of the kingdom, and the weeds are the children of the evil one. The time of harvest represents the final judgment at the end of the age when the angels would separate the children of the kingdom from the children of the evil one. The latter would be thrown into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth while the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. As Tony Cartledge points out, the primary point of this parable is not whether there will be a judgment and an ultimate separation of good and evil. That fact was assumed. The intent of this parable is to answer the question of why such judgment is delayed and to remind believers that judgment is God's business, not ours. The phrase, the field is the world, suggests that the world includes both positive and productive people on the one hand, along with bad seed, who muck things up, on the other hand. Sadly, though, the same is true of the church, which is within the world. As some have observed, the church is not solely holy. We'd like to think so, wouldn't we? Some members take Jesus seriously. They seek to live out his teachings, centering their worldviews and their lives around loving God and loving others as Jesus instructed us to do. 
They are generous with their time and their talents and their resources. They build community, keep the wheels turning, and point the church in the direction of ministry. When I think about people living this out in our world today, Shane Claiborne immediately comes to mind. A native of East Tennessee, Shane is doing good work around the world to bring the reality of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He and some friends have formed The Simple Way, a community of believers who live together in community similar to what we find in Acts chapter 2 in the early church. It's a beautiful picture of being the church. If you aren't familiar with Shane, I encourage you to look him up and learn more about his story. It's fascinating. We also know that in addition to those folks living out the vision of the kingdom, as harsh as it sounds, the church also includes people who are more like weeds than wheat. Some may draw on the church's resources without giving anything in return. Others may hinder the church's mission by clinging tightly to narrow or racist attitudes that cause the church to be cut off from the wider community. Others may bring embarrassment or harm to the church through their public behavior. And the truth is, friends, sometimes when we look inside our own minds and hearts and motivations, we may recognize elements of both weeds and wheat in our own lives. And it's up to us to decide which will win out. So what will we do with the weeds? It's best to let them grow, Jesus says. Why? Because as Jesus' parable suggests, you can never know about weeds, and sometimes we can't even be sure about wheat. You see, wheat and Darnell were so similar that some ancient people thought the Darnell weeds were just good wheat gone bad. So if good wheat can become bad weeds, could bad weeds become good wheat? Hmm. That's why Jesus said to let them both grow and then wait for the harvest, the time of judgment, which is God's business. Then God will decide what happens to them. Aren't we so glad that judgment isn't our business? It's so easy for us to judge prematurely or wrongly or incompletely. We rarely know the whole story, and we certainly don't know others' hearts. Sure, we may recognize members of the Christian community who seem to be on a different track or maybe even holding the church back, but our calling is to be patient with them and to love them no less. And we should seek to model for them what it's like to live Jesus' teaching, to love God and love others. And if we do, I believe the world will be a better place because of it. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the seed of your word that is sown in our world. Help us to worry less about the seed found in others' lives and to worry more about looking within our own hearts. May we seek to have hearts that do justice love kindness, and walk humbly with you. That love you first and love our neighbor as ourself. What a different place this world would be if we could all live the way that you call us to. Help us remember not to look at others with eyes of judgment, but with eyes of love, remembering that each person in this world is made in your image and your likeness and therefore has the potential to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.